On this episode of The Ethics Experts, we do a deep dive into Hollywood with Jay Rosen, uh, VP of Biz uh, Dev at Affiliated Monitor. So if you don't know Jay, uh, welcome to the ethics and compliance community because he is really the uh, the mayor of this space. But it's a really cool conversation. He's got a really great background. He's just a He's just a good guy, you know, um, a lot of great insights. So I uh, hope you enjoy part one of our conversation with Jay Rogan, and we'll see you soon. Welcome to the Ethics Experts, where we're elevating ethics and compliance and HR to the strategic level it's supposed to be. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. And if you are a returning subscriber, hey, bestie. Hope you're having an amazing day. The world's a better place because you're in it. You see what happens when you subscribe to The Ethics Experts. You get a bonus greeting on every single episode. So join us as we change the world by fixing our workplaces. I am here with Jay Rosen, VP of BizDev at Affiliated Monitors. Um, Jay is perhaps the most popular guy in our ethics and compliance community. I think you should run for mayor. It, that's, my, uh, that's my goal for this episode, if we can get you to put a – you know, put a sign in your yard and start getting getting a little campaign for mayor going. How's it going, Jay? It's going great, Nick. So the the mayor of E and C, huh? <laughs> Let's get you out there kissing babies, man. I've got no problem kissing babies. Very good. So let's uh, do it. <laughs> so you are at Affiliated Monitors, but um, you know, you've been called the uh, accidental ethics and compliance tourist, and so you have a really cool sort of background and story. I'd like to really kind of start at the start. Um, on how you kind of got here, because I doubt when you were little, you said I wanted to be, you know, biz dev in the ethics and compliance space. I didn't even know what the ethics and compliance space was 15 years ago. So how did you get here? Uh, okay. Well, we will, um, I, I've got five different distinct parts of my career that uh, commenced in, the, the, I'm going to give some real dates so people can do the math. They can figure out how old I am besides the fact that I've got my salt and pepper beard. But I moved out here into Los Angeles in 1987. And I had gone to school back east in Philadelphia at the Wharton School of Business. And when I was in college, I got bit by the entertainment bug. And I started working at the local television station on campus called UTV, which stood for University Television. Now, this was back in the mid to early 80s. So the signal from our studio probably didn't go two blocks. People who were on UTV were there to be resume patters to say, oh, you know, I did this, I did that. But some of us really got into it. And um, they used to have a little show called Movie Lineup. And it was like Siskel and Ebert. And what they would do is every week they'd show clips from the movies and, you know, talk about what was happening. So my roommate dialed up the phone and put it in front of my face. And I'm like, I- I'm, I'm, I'd like to be on UTV. So I went by and I went from being the PA, the personal assistant, to running the show, which was called Movie Lineup, to running the whole station to hosting my own show called Night Riot with Jay Rosen. And then after doing all this stuff, you know, I was go- I was sent to Penn to groom myself to take over the family shoe business, which was called Mort Distributors. And the, the deal about the way my dad set up his company, New England uh, was an area that had a lot of textile production in the 1860s. And then in the early 1900s, textiles morphed into shoes. So my dad's concept was that every shoe store, every factory shoe store in New England would have a factory outlet there that would sell seconds. And, you know, basically it was the precursor of having a Ross Dress for Less or Mm -hmm. a TJ Maxx, but it was way ahead of its time. So basically more shoe distributors was this concept. Yeah. Kind of a Ross for shoes. Exactly. Oh, cool. So I would I was supposed to go to Penn, learn what I was going to learn, and then come over and take over the family business. And then I said, Dad, you know, I've gotten involved with this TV thing, and it seems to be working pretty well. I'm, you know, getting the posters and getting the clips and going out and meeting with people. And I would like to, you know, go to Hollywood and see what happens. And my dad said something similar to what your dad has said in 
past episodes that my dad used to say, if you get up in the morning and you go to work, you better love what you do. Mm -hmm. And if you don't love it, you're SOL, which we all know means shit out of luck. So I think your dad gave you similar advice in the past. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we're at that age, we're in our, you know, early, late teens, early 20s, we think we know how it's going to be and we think we know how it's going to go. But to get that advice, to get that support from my family and my father was just so meaningful. Totally, and that yeah. kind of set me off on this 30 year journey to where we are today. Were you pretty nervous about that conversation? Like, did you feel like that was a real change in plans for your dad and for the family business? No, it was the easiest conversation in the world to have because he just, he was no BS. He was like, you know, straight, no shooter. Yeah. This yeah. Is like, you you got to, you know, that he, he not only practiced that for me, but it was for my two sisters as well. Everybody got the support and, you know, it makes me think about other people, friends of mine who are at Penn. And there was this one, um, student who his parents will we won't use his last name but they had the law firm of cohen and cohen and he was supposed to graduate and he'd be the third cohen so this guy mr x cohen he's been in that business now for the last 30 years and that was not what he wanted to do but he there was already uh, an office there and his name was already on the pain mm. that that's what his family expected so when you take about when you look at that issue, that's just about one person's individual happiness and work. Right. But now, like, let's take a look at all the people that we touch in our working life. If they aren't allowed to be who they are and they're not allowed to do what they want to do, why are we doing that? It just doesn't really give people the chance to be the best who they are and to contribute to their fellow people in society. Yeah. It's hard though to come to that conclusion if you're like focused on yourself too much, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, if you have these expectations for your kids to come and take over the business and you've already gotten the sign maker to come and etch their name, you know, on the glass door. Um, I don't know. There's like, it's kind of a, uh, it's like a, you know, there's like a perceived permanence to it. You know, I'm sure your buddy felt like so obligated to do that, even though that wasn't what he wanted to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think when you're in those kinds of situations, it can sometimes get difficult to find, um, I don't know, to find the silver lining or find the thing about you feel, you know, find the thing in the thing that you've been sort of, you know, handcuffed to that kind of can be that source of joy or that so source of happiness, you know? It, it can just be overwhelming too, right? Yeah. Because we're supposed to be out there. We're supposed to have the answers. And <laughs> I, I don't know if you remember the movie Working Girl mm -hmm. or Swimming with the Sharks. And there are all these kind of, you know, very the movies that talk about how to be in business and what to do in business and how you make yourself. And there was, um, you know, we'll, we'll jump ahead. So I leave Penn and I go to Los Angeles and I want, want to get involved in the movie business. So I get a job at a mailroom at a talent agency. So, so, so you just moved out there and you said, I'm going to just move out here and find a job. Like, you, mm -hmm. did you have it? So you didn't even have it lined up before you went out there? No, I mean, I had some of these PR groups that I was working with. I had connections at Columbia and at Universal and Orion. And then my uncle was in the uh, advertising business and he worked at Ogilvy and May there in New York City. Cool. So I must have had something like 20 or 30 interviews to either be in a mail room or to work at a studio. And, and to some people, you know, I, I wasn't in the right fraternity at college, so that mm -hmm. didn't let me in. And, you know, what finally happened was there was a company called Triad Artists, which got absorbed into the William Morris Agency. And I uh, was introduced to an agent there. And I. this is how random life is. After I graduated college, I took a backpacking trip to Europe. And when I was in Europe, I was introduced to a guy uh, who worked for the Comedy Festival of Montreal, which is called Just for Laughs. Yeah, big one. And he it's made, a huge, huge festival, yeah. So he made a connection with me 
and an entertainment um, agent at um, Triad. And so they brought me in. They, I met with the training program, and they were going to start me the following Monday. Well, the Friday before that Monday, I get a call from CAA, Creative Artist Agency, which, if you know, is one of the biggest in the world. Yeah. And the guy who ran it at the time was a guy named Mike Ovitz, who kind of went on to uh, non-success when he was brought by his friend Michael Eisner to come to the Walt Disney Company. And he just his his skills being a deal maker and being being in um, agenting did not really mesh with what. Uh, Michael Eisner needed as complementary skill sets. Interesting. So I, I think Eisner maybe lasted, I'm sorry, Ovitz lasted maybe a couple of years, got a huge golden parachute and never approached that level of fame again. Interesting. But they said, look, Mike Ovitz is looking for a second person to be on his desk. And for the next two years, all you're going to do is make reservations for Mr. Ovis. So you'll make his dining reservations and you'll book his limos and his airplanes. You want to do that. So I go, okay. So I call my dad up and I said, dad, um, they want me to go work for this guy Ovitz. And if I work for Ovitz, I'm never going to see the outside of his office for two years. But if I go and do this and survive and do really well, it could be the key to anything I want. Yeah. And I said, but I also have this deal where I can go to Triad and I can immediately be in the mailroom. And what you do in the mailroom is you deliver scripts to people's offices and their houses and their things like that. And my dad said, well, you made a commitment to the people at the first company. You should stick with it. So I did. And I went to Triad. But I'll never know whether or not if I would have taken that gig with with Ovitz and if I had worked for two years there, you and I might not be talking now. Right. I I would just be sitting here staring at a blank screen, you know? Yeah. Or thinking about how you could be the mayor of (laughs) Ian's. But that's crazy, right? I mean, this guy shot to some kind of fame. He was obviously a very powerful person. Looking back, I mean, I know you said that like, oh, I don't know. If you could do it again, would you have done the same thing? Do you think that that was good advice? I mean, it's, I mean, it's unarguable to some level that it's like the right thing to do. Um, I, I I think if I want to like look back as to what happened to him individually, I I probably would not want to have been associated with him. Yeah, just because he's so toxic now. Totally. But at the time, you know, it was like. He was the guy. The time, yeah. I would have hit the lottery, but it's just like, it's that one kind of little thing that you, you move a little bit, you mm-hmm. take a step across the street. And if somebody doesn't pull you back, the car hits you. Right. Right. So you go to triad, you're working in the mailroom. What was that like? Uh, it was absolutely amazing. It was like being a kid in the candy store. Um, what you would do is you would either be in the Xerox room copying scripts and contracts, or you'd have the run. And there was a morning run and an afternoon run. So I remember all sorts of bizarre stuff, like bringing a script over to Louis Anderson's house in the Hollywood Hills. And he was a short kind of compact guy, but he was big. Yeah. And when he answered the door. The bathrobe didn't quite cinch sure. all the way around his package Mm -hmm. and it was like you know i'm having to give here you go mr anderson i'm giving him a script and i'm making sure not to like look at what's dangling between his bathrobe (laughs) so that was just like bizarre (laughs) totally and uh you know for me i read a lot of books about hollywood and the studio system so i was like a kid at the candy store that i would drive on to the mgm lot And I would, you know, I didn't have to go on to the lot. I could have parked and walked. But to me, it was so meaningful to, like, go in there and see the little dressing rooms and see the names of the people. So that was something that just totally, totally jazzed me. And, um, you know, the there are people that I met in the mailroom that I'm still friends with. Really? You know, in life, 30 years later. That's so cool. 
there was just, you know, this kind of camaraderie. And what the job expectation was is you were supposed to be a sponge and take in as much as you can. So, you know, if we got a new script for Die Hard and we represented Bruce Willis as we did, you would make the 20 copies and distribute them to everyone. But you make a 21st copy for yourself. Cool. And you weren't going to you weren't like selling it or dropping it off, but you were reading it. So you could be able to talk about, oh, this guy wrote the new draft of the script for, you know, for so and so. So like J.J. Abrams, who is this major director, who did Star Wars stuff and Star Trek. He had started off in the first script he had sold was something called Taking Care of Business with Jim Belushi. So he went from doing these small pictures to being a big force in TV with Felicity and Alias. And just to, you know, somebody like him to see, I remember that name of him. And then he grew into this amazing creative powerhouse. Wow. So to have the ability to interact with those people, to see what kind of creative ideas and and find out what would sell and what wouldn't sell. So that was like some of the, the, what you were supposed to pick up by being in the mail. Yeah. You start to get to know the writers. You start to see, you know, you're, I mean, you were probably reading several scripts a week. And then in six Not a day. <laughs> yo, real okay. So you're reading tons of scripts. You're seeing in pretty short order what's getting picked up, what's working, what's not working. What were your big takeaways from that? I mean, that sounds like such a cool. So that sounds like su- such a cool job. I love I love uh, reading movie scripts. By the way, when I was there, we're talking about um, it's 1987 till 1990 or so. And this was the era of what was called the spec script. Oh, okay. And basically, you want to get yourself known in Hollywood. The way you make a lot of money in Hollywood is not having your movie made, but it's getting to be on a roster, of a very small roster of people who are script doctors. Yeah. So like the number one script doctor was William Goldman, who wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. So he was an author, he wrote screenplays, he wrote novels, and the deal that you were trying to do is he had a very kind of hard-boiled glib style, so a lot of people tried to copy that way, the way he wrote. And then what would happen is the king, uh, another king of the um, spec script was a guy named Joe Esterhaus, who did Basic Instinct, if you recall that movie. And um, he wrote a, just a lot of things that were very much kind of pushing the edge, very sexy, very much, you know, detectives trying to find out who did the murder. So what we learned there is you wanted to come up with this every man who was kind of wisecracking. So Bruce Willis was really the, a, a kind of paradigm that this is the kind of actor you would want to write towards. So Got you, you could get bruce willis to like your screenplay and he could get it made that'd be great but even better if you could come on as a script doctor and they pay you a hundred thousand dollars a week to write pages wow you know think about that if you're doing that and if you're doing that yeah. five six times a year you know you it's have crazy. a pretty good living yeah right and what a cool thing i mean that's such a cool thing um to come in and just kind of doctor the script up a little bit punch it up make it a little bit um, make it so a like little tighter. Harry Fisher, Fisher I mean, England, New, New England accent comes out. Um, she was a huge script doctor, Princess Leia. Oh, she was. And write things. She would go in and write jokes or write things from her perspective. But she made a ton of money. Wow. Carrie Fisher. That's so interesting. Um, what other um, What other stuff was getting made around that time? Because, um, I mean, that was a pretty big pivot point in that industry. As yeah, this here, new another, thing came in vogue, you know. Another guy, um, the guy who wrote um, Lethal Weapon, do you know? I don't know his name, but I've seen that a thousand Shane, times. Shane, and his last name is skipping me. <laughs> but again... Same kind of ethos Shane, there, yeah. He had this group of guys from U, UCLA, and they all like hung together at this house in West Hollywood, West Hollywood called the Pado guys. And these guys were like, you know, their own kind of rat pack, but they were a rat pack being script writers. 
Cool. And so they would all, you know, again, write the, the, the next, they would try to come up with what's the next hip thing. So like, if you're a studio and you have intellectual property, like Lethal Weapon or like Star Wars or like Star Trek, you've got a pre-built-in audience right. there. So if you can do a good job, what tends to happen is sequels make less money in kind of decreasing fashion. Yeah. So like there are a few ones that break the mold and like lethal weapon is one of those that lethal weapon two made more than one and three made more than two. I think Die Hard is that same pattern as well. Yeah. But then, you know, after a while, live free or die hard, it's like what die hard, die hard 892. Right. It's like, you know, it's like, it's got Bruce and he's still kind of wisecracking. And sometimes they did a great job, like the one with Timothy Oliphant, who's, you know, got the trucks and they're driving around D.C. and trying to blow up the world. Yeah, yeah. You know, that one worked really well. But, you know, the the thing is, is you got to come up with something, something that's repeatable and then something that people are going to want to do. And so coming up with that IP in the late 80s and the early 90s and developing that and saying that, can I do this in TV? Can I do this in film? And, and learning that. So the tough part about that is you could do that and you could come up with the right screenplay, but it might not get produced for the wrong reason. Somebody might have a competing script mm -hmm. in development. So there was a while where nobody would make a pirate movie. And then for some reason, one year they had two pirate movies that were at the same time. So you're either ahead of the curve or you're behind the, skirt, the curve. And um, what I ended up doing was I met a guy in Seattle who ended up being my writing partner. And we wrote uh, something like 11 screenplays. We optioned three of them. Cool. We got paid to do rewrites on one of them. But at the end of the day, the company that bought our screenplay had done a similar movie and they basically bought the script preemptively so it would stay off the market and they could make their film. So again, you go for the elation of selling the screenplay right. and you're like, Oh my God, you know, I got my name in the variety in the Hollywood reporter, but then it's like the guy who's my producer doesn't want to make my movie and he's taking as long as he can to keep me off the marketplace because How he doesn't crazy. want the script to get made. So uh, can I indulge you for three Please, minutes? Please, yes. Yeah, this is great. So the movie was called um, Double Blind, as in a double blind experiment. Mm -hmm. So there's a guy who's our hero, and he's a former stuntman in the movies. And he has a company called Double Your Pleasure. So if you want to appear, if you want to have Madonna sing at your birthday party, he's got a person who's like a, a double who will show up and be Madonna or be Marilyn Monroe. At the same time, he can allow you to be in two places at the same time. So what happens is we are going into the War Memorial Opera House in San Francisco. And his limousine pulls up and a guy steps out of the limousine and he has just the right touch of gray in his hair. And he brings a very attractive woman with him. And all of a sudden, <coughs> he coughs. And they're going into the opera house and he takes the, his wife's jacket and he says to her, he doesn't say to her, but he motions to her, I'll meet you up in the uh, opera box. So he goes into the coat check room and gives the coat to the woman there. Suddenly we have cross cuts of the woman in the coat check pulls the man into a sexy embrace and they start going for it. The other woman ent enters up into the opera box. The fat lady sings, the couple in the coat room orgasm and the guy excuses himself <coughs> from the opera box. He walks down the steps and he comes in and looks face, face to face with the guy who's coming up the steps. He looks down and says X, Y, Z. And the guy realizes his fly is open. He zips it. He goes back up into the box with his wife. And the guy who's coming down the steps 
takes this gray powder out of his hair, takes a fancy ring, throws it out, and walks down into the front of the opera house. You've just met your hero, Gil Hardy. Gil is a former stuntman. He's the owner of this company, Double Your Pleasure. And if you want to take your wife to the opera and hit the hat check girl, you can do that because he allows you to do it. Well, here's the quick thing that happens. Gil is pretending to be somebody and he's going over the Golden Gate Bridge. The car that he's in is ambushed and Gil gets shot off the bridge. Now, since he's a former stuntman, he doesn't get killed, but as they're blowing him away with guns, he jumps out over the trestles of the of the Golden Gate Bridge, hooks himself on, and now he's got to figure out, do they want to kill him because he's pretending to be this guy Putnam, or do they want to kill him because he's pissed off the Russian mob? So we sold this thing, and, you know, it's like, the last page says, you know, this is double blind. He says, "In our, come back and watch Gil Hardy, who will appear in triple threat. So we already had anticipated double blind, triple threat. And here's the part where it gets, you know, I get chills when I talk about it. We were optioned by Michael Keaton. And this was wow. just as Michael Keaton stopped being Batman. So oh we said, gosh. this is going to be the first, you know, Michael Keaton action movie after Batman. And he's got this real kind of, you know, oh, he's crazy. Great. Yeah, he's nuts. You know, he's, he's funny. He's nuts and he's funny. And you can see him delivering these things. So I remember being in Europe on vacation with my family and talking to my writing partner. And we're just like, oh, you know, shit, we're, we got it. We got it. Michael Keaton. We've got this screenplay. And of course, it got sucked up in development hell and didn't go anywhere brutal but you can just have such highs and such lows yeah i mean such highs and such lows i mean you're toiling over the script and you're doing rewrites and you're doing different drafts and you're passing them around town trying to get picked up you get picked up you get the michael keaton thing and then it just gets sort of caught it was like a chess move or something that's crazy yeah were you who did you envision like did you envision an actor when you were writing it, we we kind of figured out it was either going to be like a a, a Bruce Willis, um, you know, a, a Mel Gibson, um, and and that's why we didn't we didn't initially think it would be Keaton, but just to think about yeah. well, how perfect, especially that he's decide you know because he's if he's going to bring his audience from Batman and he's going to have a new action movie. Oh, you know, yeah. this, this is like right up his alley. Yeah. And I mean, with that kind of a tailwind, it would probably do well enough to, you know, get that triple threat going. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Um, I just read about today uh, that Warner Brothers um, made an entire, uh, I think it was like Road Roadrunner vs. Acme movie. Um, mm -hmm. So it was Road Roadrunner vs. Coyote. The whole thing is made and done. And they're just putting it in the vault forever to like not release it. How crazy well, is that? Imagine that. Yeah. Well, they also did that with what wasn't there a bat Batwoman thing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they're writing it off, and they obviously get like a massive tax credit for it. But I mean, you know, I'm just saying, you know, writing a script, getting it picked up, getting it optioned with that actor—that's brutal. How much even more brutal if you like made the whole movie, the editing's done, and yeah. like you never launch the the advertising. You know what I mean? And they're like, ah, we're just going to, th you know, throw this one out. I mean, that, that, that is just mind boggling to me. It's uh, it's mind boggling that you have an industry that rewards that, you know? Well, that's what I was thinking about. I mean, they have an incentive to, to do that. And I mean, it's a pretty interesting kind of phase that this whole industry is in. How is it, how have you seen it change from when, when you were out there? Because we're in this mode now where. Well, I remember there is the. Writers Guild strike of 88 and we just had the Writers Guild strike of 2023. Right. So there's still going to be the studios who who are, who are the bank, right? They're going to they're going to pay for the movie. They've got all the money. So basically they're a glorified bank mm -hmm. because they're not developing talent anymore. It's not like you had a dream factory here in the 30s and the 40s mm -hmm. and you had 10, you know, 10 people who were writing in this room and 10 people working on this 
and they're working on the Thin Man script and this or that. So since I entered the business back in 87, they keep going more and more towards just being a place to raise funding. And then they also have the distribution, right? That they're the, um, that they've got access to all the theaters. And what's kind of changed now is that Netflix, you know, blew the whole paradigm up. Yeah, right. Because you don't need to get people to go see movies in the theater anymore because they're streaming at home. And so, you know, that's where when Netflix started out, if you recall, you used to get your DVDs mailed to. Right. And that was just a stopgap that they always had the vision of the future that it was going to be delivered on video on demand. It, it used to be VOD and people would say, what the hell is VOD? You know? Right. And, you know, now we've got a situation where I'm watching the NFL on my TV streaming it and that there are all these other people that don't have to have access to a, uh, a satellite anymore. Right. You don't have to subscribe to a network. You can just go to Gmail or YouTube and you can basically watch the NFL there every week. Yeah. I mean, how, uh, how much foresight was that to say, we got to change how these are, how this, how this media is delivered. And you know, that old story of when they went to, uh, to Blockbuster to try to partner with them and Blockbuster, I think they, I forget, there was like a $5 million number thrown around or something, $30 million, some, some relatively small number. And, yeah. Um, I think they got like laughed out of that meeting and that was like such fuel for them to, uh, to launch this thing. Yeah. I mean, the change is the change is absolutely wild. And, um, then you're seeing, you know, there's been this kind of interesting change where a study came out, I think, I don't know, 15 years ago or something that, um, there was a pretty material, um, a material or like a statistically, according to the study, a statistically significant difference uh, between, um, you know, movie performance based on budget. So if it had like a $40, $40 million, you know, budget, it would generate X. Mm -hmm. And if it had a $90 million budget, it would gen generate like 10 X. So then you saw this sort of trend in the movie business of, um, you know, I mean, budgets now are just like off the charts, like for even for shows on Disney, they're, they're spending 300 million, 400 million bucks. And um, that really popped for a while. But now it seems to be like they're spending a lot of – I mean Disney is a great example over the last two years just like how much money they've lost on their movie business from you know spending hundreds of millions of dollars on these productions that end up not really performing in, you know, in the theater or even, even on streaming. You know? Well, I, I think they may have taken their eye off the prize. And for a little bit it was like what are we going to do during COVID? Mm -hmm. So for a while they effortlessly – slid in and all the stuff that was supposed to go into the theaters got dumped, not dumped, but they, 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 they got, they became streaming. And what happened was um, like one of the things that pissed off a lot of the creative people here, Warner brothers made a decision without consulting with any of the talent that all the movies that they were going to show in whatever year it was to 2020 or 2021, they were simultaneously going to go, on hbo and that's they right were they were launching them concurrent years. yeah right so at one point they were taking their inventory and, and getting cash out of it but they were screwing up the contracts they had because a lot of the things like there was a big big thing with scarlett johansson at disney that she was not going to get she was going to make less than she would have made if the movie received a theatrical release got you yeah because it's like none of those other views counted or something for her her comp plan or something. Yeah, so they kept um, Black Widow on the bench for almost like a couple of years. That's and then right. When it, when it finally came to the theater, everyone was like, well, this is what we're waiting for. You know, we, we would have liked this two years ago, but now, right. you know, what's up with that? So Disney's game was playing. They were trying to take on Netflix and saying, look, we just want to get more and more subscribers. Right. So they were taking the content online getting people to subscribe but what that did is it kind of left a hole in their um in their distribution plan so when it was time to get back into the theaters they weren't in the same position because they were trying 
to get people to subscribe to Disney Plus. Right. And by doing Disney Plus, you were getting them to come in, but you basically, um, it, it just was kind of screwing up the model. So you got a lot of churn. Yeah. And churn is people coming on the system. Maybe I'm coming on just for Loki, or maybe I'm coming on for a Star Trek or rather Star Wars. After I see that, I'm going to churn right off. Right. So it wasn't long term growth. It was an illusion of growth. And now, you know, with things getting bad, with how, all these strikes, with the the car strikes, the writer strikes, the actor strikes, now people, you know, Wall Street for the whole last year has been doom and gloom about, you know, having to, you know, w- worry about starting to let people go. And that's where we're at now. And so Disney is saying, I'm not going to pay money for these um, for these certain series that even though I commission them, I have to pay money to have them streaming. So I'm going to take them off the streaming service. Interesting. So what do you yeah, think that's so- going to lead to? I mean, it's such an interesting time, right? I mean, there's this massive pivot in the sort of the, the distribution or, you know, how these products essentially are are provided to people, how, how people consume them. You have this crazy churn going on. You know, everybody's like streaming uh, bill is probably bigger than their, like remember when streaming first came out and everyone was like cord cutting and then they were like, cool, I can save money on like cable now. Well, I think everybody's streaming bill is probably like what their old cable bill used to be. So like that's been yeah. all replaced. I think they've kind of rearranged the chairs on the Titanic. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And they're, you know, calling it by a different name, but it's still... At the end of the day, that one of the things that were keeping the actors and the writers um, from settling was the whole AI situation that, mm-hmm. you know, imagine you're Tupac now, right? And people can do a deep fake on you. And right. so if we get to a point and they say, you know, give me an actor that's six feet tall and that has curly hair and that yeah. you know d- shoots with his left hand. You can create that now, and the writers and the actors needed stipulations to go in and say, I can't, you know, the studio does not have any rights to my likeness. It's kind of like the whole thing with NIL and the NCAA, mm-hmm. right, that I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a quarterback and I don't want to play at Auburn and I want to play at Notre Dame. Well, you know, I'm the one who's going to benefit from that, not you. Right. So, again, I think that there's – It's really kind of interesting, but kind of scary about AI doesn't have anything to keep it on the third rail. Yeah. So we get to the point, I mean, we're looking at what's happening in the world right, right now. How do we get to the point and understand, is this person really a, a, a candidate for the presidency of the United States or is he somebody else that, you know, he, we, we've created an avatar, we've created an AI that's going to go out and say controversial things and they're going to get attributed to this candidate. The candidate is going to say, it wasn't me. It was my my AI. So it's like, how, how do we use AI for good, but how do we keep AI from being, being used for bad? Yeah. That's such a good question. I mean, the implications of it are just like unknown and it's not necessarily, I mean, odds are it's going to be used equally for good and bad, right? Just like everything else. Um, and it just like widens, like the good of it can be great, but the bad of it can be so, so confusing and have really, really negative impacts. I mean, that could wreck somebody's career, wreck it, wreck their reputation. I mean, it's already kind of happening. Like it's, it's happening Mm -hmm. on social, you know, you see something and then there's like community notes below it or comments below it saying that like, oh, this is fake or this is AI generated. And like, you really can't tell. I mean, I think pretty soon we're going to see. So I don't know like what, what caused that writer strike to end. I know there was some really big, I, again, this is like, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure how accurate this is, but you know, I think that a lot of writers weren't getting any credit for stuff that was going on streaming, you know, as a, you know, remember back in the day, it's like, if you had a show, the goal was always to get it to a hundred episodes so that that could go into syndication and then you can get that mm-hmm. mailbox money. I think there was an issue with that. Then the AI thing as well. And it's an, it's such an interesting, um, conflict because I think you see this with writers just like in marketing right now, like copywriters, they don't want to like embrace the AI thing because they're kind of threatened by it. But like there's AI generated copy for marketing that's like really good. So, you know what I mean? Um, and then if you look at the studio's perspective, obviously they're trying to maximize profits and, um, you know, 
they're probably thinking like, have I been overpaying for this creative for so long? Or is this a, like a valid, you know, creative substitute for, you know, the next, you know, pad of paddle guys or whatever, whatever those, uh, that those writing I, I, rack I pad was. My understanding of what happens in the writer's room is like, you know, say you're on uh Frasier, right. And there's, 12 or 15 people in the writer room and some of the people are senior writers and some of them are punch of guys and jokers and people who write jokes. Um, say the studio now says, look, I don't want to pay for 15 people in the writer's room. I want to pay for three. Right. So the younger people who get in there as a learning experience don't even get to come in because their job has been eliminated. Mm -hmm. And if you're the assistant to the, you know, to the chief writer, you're going to say, look, you know what? You used to take notes. You're going to take notes again and you're going to do this. And, you know, you're instead of you getting five screenplays to write. And if you get an individual writing credit, you get more residuals on it. You're going to come in and you're going to do all the work. But at the end of the day, my name's going to go on top of it. So that's right. what you're talking about. You're losing the number of positions and they're getting less paid. And so, you know, it, it's kind of like if you don't stop at some point, it's all going to be artificial writers. Mm -hmm. So they were fighting for their future to say, we we still need to get people to come in and we need to have, you know, you're, you're talking about normally there used to be 22 episodes in a season. Yep. You know, now you're lucky if there's eight or 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it doesn't change the amount of work. It actually means that there's less stuff because it would take one year. What we used to do now takes two years. And so again, you've got my sisters in post-production. So she basically, when her last show ended before the strike, she hasn't been paid and people oh, wow. who work on shows when they go on hiatus, they kind of build your money in that. Maybe you're making $150,000 but you get that spread out out of 52 weeks. Mm. You're not really getting paid because you got paid ahead of time. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now they have to go in and all these people, they haven't been able to work, work or look for jobs because the studios are not making anything. And that's why the, one of the things that they've set out here is that. So the fall TV season. And so in the summer movies don't slip or slip away. They needed to start putting things into production now. So the window was November. And if you don't get things going in November, you almost lose another whole season. And they what they just lost was basically four months of the strike. Okay, so the, the strike was four months. So you think them getting it figured out, they're not going to have – it's not like we're not going to have any movies. No, we, we just won't have as many as we want, wanted to have in the pipeline. Interesting. And then, and then the question is, again – is how do you split that up between going to see them in the theater or, you know, something's got to be pretty damn good if I'm going to go out and see it in the movie theater. And that's usually just a Marvel movie. Yeah. Well, like, there, there's this new movie. Um, oh, the, the guy who was in Sideways, what's his name? Paul Giamatti. Okay. So there's a new movie that's being advertised, the, the holdout, and that's on. And it's directed by Alexander Payne, who is a writer director mm -hmm. who did Sideways. So something like that, although I'm really jazzed to see it, I don't need to see that on a big screen. Totally. I, I can wait two months or six months or whatever and see it when it streams on TV. So, you know, they're also trying to it used to be that you've got, you know, a 30 million dollar movie used to be a mid sized movie. Yeah. That's like nothing. That's almost like an independent movie. Right. And then you got Marvel films that are a quarter of a billion dollars. So they still haven't figured out a way how to predict how to protect those small movies. Right. And where do those small movies go? Do they go to a, you know, an, an Angelica theater? Do they go to a, an art house place, or do they just come home? Yeah, they and just go straight to streaming or something. Too. Yeah. So they have they have to make the economics work. And they have to share and they, the automotive industry, hopefully is going to share and the writers and the directors and the actors, they're all going to share because the longer and longer we have these stripes, 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 not stripes, the worse it's going to be for our economy. Um, 
uh, what did you say? You said something about, um, um, oh, oh yeah, I was going to say the, uh, like, you saw, s I think, like, comedy movies were hit more than anything with this, like, budget shift thing. Because, like, there used to be 8 to 12, like, comedy movies per year that were 15 million, 30 million, kind of under that 30 million level. And now, like, you just don't see any comedy movies. Like, there was a time, like, maybe, I don't know, 2008 to maybe 2000. 12, 15 area where there was like just so many comedy movies coming out and now it's like you're really lucky to I mean I'm saying in the theater um, there's obviously still stuff I guess it's it's still like a little bit more sparse but um, it's just interesting how that shift that sort of like paradigm shift the mentality shift of the studios has led to you know what's coming out and what's kind of flopping I mean well, a lot also, of these gotta, the last handful of like, go ahead sorry you got a place like Netflix that says I want to be in the Adam Sandler business and they don't care whether it's going to go have a theatrical, theatrical release at all. Yeah, right. And that for the Adam Sandler audience on Netflix, which has, I think, supported his movies to over $2 billion. Crazy. That's nuts. So, isn't you know it? what? He, he, he broke the paradigm. He's like, I'm going to go to work for Netflix. And this is what we're going to We're going to make movies that I know my fans like. Yeah. And, you know, he gets roasted a lot, but I don't know. I mean, you know what you're going to get? I mean, like getting a bag of of uh, Cheetos, you're not going to equate that to a steak, but you know what you're getting when you open that bag. You know what I mean? He's uh, just very generous to the people he works with. Oh, he's with. great. Yeah, and he he's... is great. Um, I've uh, I started listening to this podcast called Fly on the Wall. Have you heard of that? No. Oh, it's great. Um, it has uh, Dana Carvey and um, David Spade um, okay. from Saturday Night Live, and they're just interviewing all of these comedians. You know, all these guys that they used to work with on Saturday Night Live and all that stuff. And it's just it's so, so interesting because you, you know, after you listen to a couple, you, you know, I really start to get a uh, some insight into like what that whole business is like, you know, how crazy it is. And anyways, they were, you know, they talked a lot about um, uh, or they talk about Adam Sandler all the time because they've both been in his movies and all that. And they said that um, He's one of those guys that came into Saturday Night Live and he just had like tremendous confidence. He was like an Eddie Murphy type where he just came on and he was killing right out of the bat. And like most people, when they go on, it takes them a couple seasons to really start to build their confidence. But he was just so confident coming right in uh, because his, you know, his mother, you know, built him up growing up that he could do anything, you know. And um, um, there's this uh, story they tell where, you know, uh, Adam Sandler in his first season, he's like, oh, I love that guy. I'm going to put him in all my movies. And David Spade was like, your movies, what are you talking about? You just got here, you know? But just he's, he's had that vision for so long, mm -hmm. and he stayed pretty, uh, pretty um, you know, he's kind of stayed pretty true to himself for sure. And look at the, like, span of things that he's done. I mean, it's pretty pretty, pretty interesting. I finally saw Uncut Gems, like, a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. That was crazy, you know? You see the one where he plays the basketball scout? Um, big, uh, Yugoslavian no, guy. no, no. But I just, I just heard about that. I heard that, awesome. that that when was the, great. When the is in it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's totally cause the guy loves basketball. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely check it out. I will check it out. Anything else you've seen recently? We didn't even talk about compliance, man. We just talked well, Hollywood I, I all day. We, I think we're going to have to burn this off. This could be a, an extra part too, but uh, if you want to like schedule another time okay, and we'll have you know, we'll keep to the four corners of the agreement. <laughs> okay. I, I've, I've got like all these little notes and stuff. I can maybe put together a suggested outline. Yeah. Let's, let's just do a part two. Um, I mean, this was a really fun conversation though. Like I'd love to still, still publish it, but we'll just do a part two and you know, we okay. can, we can do that in a, in a couple of weeks. And if you want to send me the, uh, the outline, then we'll just, you know, kind of, kind of go through that. But, um, I mean, we didn't even get into, you know, the impact you've made in this industry and, you know, how you've seen this change since 2008, all that kind of stuff. So we definitely need to do a part two. And I promise yeah. I won't ask so many questions about what's going no, on in no, Hollywood. No, <laughs> I, I love people, man. I love talking to you. You, you know, you said you said we we're going to do this like what, like two years ago. And I we know. Finally we finally made it happen. Our calendar. So it, it's awesome. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't thought about that whole Mike Ovitz thing. Since I just started telling you, I mean, it's been years yeah. since I even thought about the guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to look him up because uh, I've heard the name, but I don't know the details of, you know, his toxicity and all of that. So I'll have to check that out. What's cool about him is he was one of five agents who broke away from the William Morris agency. Mm. So it was a situation that, again, you have these old guys 
who were making the deals and you had these young Turks and they weren't listening to the Turks. So they basically broke away and they set up shop with like card tables and their wives answered the phones and they just went in and they started cherry picking all these actors and all these sitcom writers from William Morris and just stole the stole it blind. How crazy. And they basically uh, Ovitz is known to have said to Joe Esterhaus that I'm going to take my foot soldiers who walk up and down Wilshire Boulevard and blow your fucking brains out. Amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, they had this whole kind of like, you know, mobster swagger. But um, there's one book about De Palma and making um, a movie called The Devil's Candy, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. But I'll, I'll try to figure out there. There's like a history of um, there's a history of CAA that you can listen to as a podcast or you can read the book. And um, it's this guy who also did a, a thing about um, he did a whole audio series about SNL. Oh, did he? And then, okay. Yeah. And then there was another one all about ESPN. Cool. And these are like different podcast series? Different podcasts. So I'll, I'll oh, sweet. The- yeah, yeah. Yeah, that sounds super interesting. I just love uh, – I love the behind the- – I love seeing and hearing how the sausage is made because it's just such a – because I love sausage. You know what I mean? And, and it's just crazy when you look at back uh, at all these stories. There are all these young people who come in who don't know any better. But right. They want to shake things up. Right. You know, they, they, they it's, it's like – it's it's like innovation. You can never really put a cover on innovation because there's always going to be somebody who thinks that they can do it different or they can do it better. And and they don't really, you know, it's like you're, you're Elon Musk, right? And you're like, you're, you're going to create your software company and then you're going to create Tesla and you don't know any better because you, th- you think it can be the best thing out there. And now I'm in California and it's like every other car is a Tesla. I know. It's crazy. It's so nuts. And like even with SpaceX, um, SpaceX, like 90 plus, literally, literally 90 plus percent of the components that go into their um, their rockets, they manufacture. Whereas like their biggest competitor, they have like over 1,200 vendors to mm-hmm. construct these things. And so kind of to your point, I mean, he looked at it, he looked at all the ingredients and he said, we can make these rockets for way, way cheaper. So, yeah, you can't put a cap on that um, or a cover, as you said. You can't put a cover on that innovation because there's always outliers and there's always somebody who's going to come in and, to your point, they don't know better. They don't have respect for the the old way. They can bring that sort of beginner's mind or those fresh eyes to, eyes to a problem and, you know, roll the dice to try to solve it a different way. It's it's so cool. It's so inspiring, Absolutely. you know. Well, listen, man. Thank you so much for joining. We will uh, reske- You know, we'll schedule part two. We're just we're just scratching the surface of the Jay Rosen story here. So I love it. Thanks for having me on, Nick. Hi, uh, right, brother. And uh, have a great long weekend. You too, man. Take it easy. Bye bye. Right, take care.